and um, you know, it's just to give you a little perspective. It's sort of it's been a bucolic profession, actually. You know, we go out there, we look at bugs crawling around on trees and trying to figure out the best way to minimize their impact. Uh, and you know, in the good old days, that was basically to keep them from going out, break to keep trees alive, and you know, it's like it was pretty wasn't that difficult. Now we're faced with uh, a very different um, set of rules with these invasive species that have come in recently. Uh, primarily the emerald ash borer and the hemlock woolly adelgid, they're game changers. Uh, it's, they kill trees, they kill them rather rapidly and we don't really have uh, very many tools to work with because they're so aggressive. Uh, you, you from um, Michigan are very well aware of what's happened basically. Um, the emerald ash, it's like, and, and please, I, I prefer when you use, when you talk about these things, don't say if. It's when it'll get here. There's just no question about it. Both bugs, they will be here. So don't don't even kid yourself about you know not thinking about it until it arrives. Because mm -hmm. actually, the best thing we can do is start planning well before it does get here, so we can help mitigate the impacts the impacts that you outlined. Um, in the watershed, you know, I think that they're they can be very dramatic. In this area, the hemlocks occupy a very important ecological role uh, in regards to water quality and maintaining the stability of slopes, perhaps. Um, and think about it. What will come in behind it? What else do we have uh, that, that operates that way? It's like it's very valuable for wildlife in the wintertime. Uh, and we work with very basic soils around here. so. I'm not a soil chemist, but I'm a biologist, and I, you know, I can't help but think that the acidity that the hemlocks bring to the soil uh, uh, increases the diversity of the soil microorganisms. And the operational word with biology, in order to have a resilient uh, ecosystem, diversity is one of the major components of that. And diversity in the in the soil microbes, I think, is important. So you know, not only the fact that it offers habitat, winter habitat to many uh, animal and bird species. So hemlock is, is what we refer to as a keystone species uh, in the ecosystem up here. And if you really want to get scared, go down uh, to the Appalachian Mountains and see what's happened to their hemlocks down there. It's, it's really dramatic to see uh, huge, I mean, huge dead trees uh, over the landscape. Um, and they're working draft very quickly right now to try and save like one percent two percent so you know it's like um they got started late and we're sort of lucky on on both with both bugs because we're the beneficiary of others uh, uh experience hemlock is a different story hemlock it's been a, a wild uh how would you say a wild ride with the hemlock woolly adelgid <laughs> Hemlock woolly adelgid is a little tiny sap sucking uh, bag of protoplasm. <laughs> That's the best I can say it. It's an aphid like thing. It has mouth parts that go into the tree. It injects a hormone into the bark, into the uh, uh, actually the, the uh, ray, xylem ray parenchyma cells, and makes them fat, but that at the same time, and then they eat on that, but at that at the same time, in the twig, the tree has its own defenses, and it's their generic defenses against invasion. You know, you harm a tree with a hatchet or something, it actually walls off that wound. You, you get, uh, uh, you know, a pathogen coming in. The tree has a generic walling off thing. So if you have a million of these little aphids putting their mouth parts into your twigs, you're going to try and wall them off. But at the same time, what you're doing is you're disrupting your capacity to transport nutrients along the twigs and so the needles die and you get bud die back and gradually the tree dies. Um, depends on how rapidly the bugs grow. You get warmer climates like in the southern Appalachians, trees die in four years. It's been up here in the Finger Lakes area for about six years, seven years now, mm -hmm. and we're just seeing die back right now. So it takes a little bit longer up here, but not that long. Uh, and we're actually very similar mm -hmm. When we think about the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, it grows in the winter time. And so when you think about the effect of climate on the hemlock woolly adelgid, you don't think about summertime growing temperatures, you think about wintertime temperatures. And if you look at the wintertime temperatures, they're very similar to the Delaware Water Gap down there in northern New Jersey. Uh, we have the influence of the Ontario Plain. So it's actually in between here and, and the Delaware Water Gap, 
there's it's colder but you know it's actually this is this Delaware water gap is experiencing extreme mortality right now uh, six years trees are dying and, and actually the manager there um, is sorry that he didn't do more to treat the hemlock trees uh, when he uh, at, the, at the time so we have the benefit of his experience and let's see where was I hemlock woolly adelgid okay let me rewind I've sort of painted the picture of, of that let me look at some of the strategies Hemlock woolly adelgid is native to three areas. There are three distinct biotypes. You've got China, <laughs> Japan, and the Pacific Northwest of North America. Okay, three different biotypes. And all those locations, the trees have <laughs> resistance and there's natural enemies. Here in Eastern North America, we have the Japanese biotype that became established in the 50s around Richmond, Virginia, and has spread throughout the Eastern seaboard since then. Okay, it got into the Appalachians and it's just wreaked havoc. Uh, killing all sorts of trees. So we got it in here in the Finger Lakes just recently, about six or seven years ago. And um, the evolution of the control for this has been, you know, it's, it's always a learning curve. You get it and you think, oh man, what is this? It takes a couple of years to figure out what it is, how it operates, you know, exactly what's going on biologically. And then you're thinking, okay, how do we control it? What do we do? Uh, what is our management strategy? And that takes a couple of years to develop. So, you know, basically we didn't realize it was a problem until it got out of Richmond, the Richmond area and got into the mountains and started really going crazy. So we've really been working on it for maybe the past 15, 20 years. Um, and we've come up with two tactics, I think, that uh, work right now. Um, number one uh, are uh, systemic insecticides. Um, uh, the neonicotinids, you know, the well reviled class of chemicals uh, uh, that I think is actually an incredibly useful uh, aspect uh, for preserving hemlock. <coughs> okay? It's a systemic, it gets into the tree, and it protects the tree for up to seven years with one application, which is an amazing tool. There's really very few times you find something as effective as that. And if you're thinking about honeybees, you needn't there are no nectaries on, on hemlock trees. They're all wind pollinated. There's no reason a honeybee would be found anywhere near the hemlock tree. Okay? So, there you go. Uh, the, um, so, that, that is one of the strategies, but that's only a short term strategy. Okay? That keeps basically the big trees alive. And that's what we need. We need to buy time because we need to establish biological controls. And we've been working on biological controls, and we have, I think, uh, one, we need, it's actually, we need a suite of biological controls, but we have one in particular right now that's been very effective. It's from the Pacific Northwest. It's the most common uh, predator in the Pacific Northwest. It's a little tiny beetle called Laracobius nigrinus, and I released about 2,500 of them in the last two days up here. I collected them down in North Carolina. They were introduced into North Carolina about 10 years ago, and they've spread from the initial introduction point about 20 miles away. And this fall, not only myself but others have collected over 11,000 uh, down there. And so they're reproducing very well, uh, and they are affecting control. So there's hope. But what we need to do is we need to buy time for the biological controls to become established. And that's why we have to go out there on the landscape and actually choose our priorities. Where do we put our energy? I think a watershed is a pretty good priority uh, to maintain the integrity of the watershed. State parks, Treeman Park, Teganic Park, they have infestations. Treeman has the most, the longest, uh, uh, longest, the, the oldest infestation around. Um, and it just got into Letchworth Park. But then we also have, you know, beautiful state forests around here, like Michigan Hollow. Uh, I actually just, just uh, Thursday found it in Texas Hollow. And that's a very, very high priority for me because it has an acidic bog in it. Uh, the only acidic bog within miles and miles. And so I actually, I released right there. There were just a couple of trees and hopefully those predators will keep down the population. Um, so treatment in Texas Hollow I think is really difficult, but get, them, get the bugs in there, get the predators in there really early and it might be a viable thing. So there's, there's things to think about. We have tools now, finally, thanks to the wor work uh, of others in other areas. And um, now we just need to help, I think, be aware of them and to look at what we have in place and decide what to do.
So yeah, you can see them all over. And it has sort of a lacy appearance to it. Um, you look across the way there, and most of those trees don't pay no attention to the big pines. But the, low, the smaller trees are the hemlocks. On the other side of the stream there, you see how they're sort of leaning over the stream? And you can imagine in the hot part of the day when the sun is, is going over to the west, that actually they provide a heck of a lot of shade on that stream. And they're gonna, that's why people come here to cool off in the summertime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, I've been thrown out by the police up here. Uh, <laughs> but, the, you know, it's like that's, that's part of the ecosystem service they provide. They cool the temperatures, and without that cool stream temperatures, we wouldn't have uh, the native brook trout. The native brook trout need to have cool streams for their, to reproduce in. Mm -hmm. But I'd also like to mention that the way the hemlock woolly adelgid gets around, okay, right now, if you wanted to try and start an infestation by grabbing onto a branch with hemlock woolly adelgids on it, it wouldn't work. Not at all. So most of the time, most of the year, you can go around and, you know, get full of hemlock woolly adelgid dust and, and you wouldn't be able to infect any other stands, or infest any other stands. Only when the eggs hatch, Around the end of March, or the beginning of April, when the eggs hatch, the first instar that comes out is what we call a crawler. It's got some, it's actually, you know, it's like, okay, the adult's a millimeter in size. So this is about less than a quarter of a millimeter in size. Teeny tiny little thing. But its legs are actually really operational. It moves really quickly. And if you look at it under a dissecting scope, it seems like it's on a race course. It's amazing. <laughs> But those, you know, they can get blown around by wind, but what are the chances of them getting transported in the wind a long distance? Not, not very good, right? The most, the most important long distance transporter we feel are birds. What they'll do is they'll come in the winter time, around that time of year, they'll come to land on the twig. The crawler is fast, it'll get on their feet. The bird will take off, where will it go? Well, it'll probably take a drink of water and then it'll go find another hemlock maybe and perch on that, then it'll come off and boom, there you go. I have what I call the skipping stone theory of population expansion, where it's sort of like I find in areas just there'll be a population and then there won't be any around it and then you'll find another population nearby. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, and that's why I think the birds are so important. But within a spot, the wind just dropping down and infiltrating down, that's how they spread throughout the trees. Um, but here you go, it's like here you have branches right next to a stream. If I was adventurous, I'd walk over there right now and look at those branches because that's where we find infestations starting. Lower down. Mm -hmm. Right next to streams, yeah. right, where the birds come, they the get birds. a drink of water, and they go up. So when you're doing a survey, you don't go into the deep part of the woods. You want to stay to the edges where birds might be using the branches that we have uh, when, you, when you go out into the woods is you see different age groups of, of trees. And um, I always have a special thing in my heart for, for large trees, and it's not just because they're big and magnificent. No, I'm too much of a biologist, although I grew up in the West Coast with huge trees. But I finally found the argument that makes sense for me, and that's that big trees, what do they represent? They represent an individual that's stayed and managed to persevere in one place. Trees don't move that much, even though one of my friends likes to refer to them as herds. Uh, but they stay in place and they've survived for years and years and years. There's very valuable genes in that because there's been all sorts of things that have hit that tree over time, but they've survived. You get a young tree, they're untried. And so when you're thinking about reestablishing a forest over our landscape, you want to use the genes that have survived, that are valuable in that place over time, not the little ones. You don't want to go to Kmart and buy a little tree, you know, that came from somewhere else. You want to get the local genotype that's withstood the pressures of time in place. So, when it comes to hemlock woolly adelgid, when I approach a stand, I look to the big trees as the future of the stand. And the problem with the hemlock woolly adelgids it's like they'll infest all the trees, but the large trees, they oftentimes, they can't sustain an infestation as long as young trees do, because they have a more fragile uh, 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 a vascular system. 
uh, and so it can be can be compromised. And so, the Delgids, when they first move into a stand, they'll take out the oldest trees first. Aww. And so that's why I think it's really important when you're approaching. It's like the now, now you have time to plan in the stand. You know, you have the Adelgid. It's like you got to think about. Okay, what are we going to do? Well, oh, well, there's a big dead hemlock there. You want to look at the big ones. Try and preserve those first, and then go to the young ones. Introduce biocontrol, so actually the biocontrol agents, the beetles, have food to eat on the young trees. And then maybe, you know, then monitor and keep introducing insects, keep introducing predators. And so over time, you'll have the populations of the predators built up to the point that you're going to be able to impact the population and return health to the trees.